There we go. So, hi everybody. I'm I'm Mike DiPaolo. I'm one of the uh, installer developers. Uh, uh, I'm the Pulp Service Reliability Engineer, which means I'm assigned to our installer slash deployment methods, which is the most technically correct way of referring to them. Um, I'm primarily on the Ansible-based installer. Fabricio, you want to introduce yourself? Dennis? Oh. Uh, there, here, go ahead, Fabricio. So, hi, everyone. My name is Fabricio, and... Yeah, I'm on the installer team, working with the pulp installer and pulp operator. Dennis, you here? Hey, well, I'll let uh, Matthias or Pavel go. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's do it. I guess they were having was, trouble getting back to their uh, back to their desks. It looks like Mike. Yeah. Okay. Well, when they, when they arrive, uh, we'll introduce. Uh, but basically, you know, Dennis is also an, an experienced installer developer, more so on the installer than the operator. But he is and Pablo have also made significant contributions to the installer as well. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, let's do an overview of the installers for this. Uh, you know, for people that are unfamiliar, especially those that have not. Uh, that are just you know developers or users. So, the in Ansible installer is one we refer to as the installer. It's technically it's Ansible collection or a set of Ansible rules that people use with either a dead simple playbook and they run against a machine or a cluster, or they integrate into a larger set of Ansible uh, playbooks and rules um, for running a defined and complete set of the environments. Oh shit! Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to share. A screen. I'm glad there's somebody else who curses. Yeah. I try to use it sparingly. It only has effect effect when you use it sparingly and when it's significant. Good luck. Yep. So, yeah, the Ansible installer has two different like sources of the actual uh, Python you know code. Uh, they're both Basically, dumb is you know, nothing but compile and do the manual install. They don't do configuration. Uh, all the configuration is done via the, an the uh, via Ansible logic. The two modes are pip mode, you know, Python packages, or RPM mode for for CentOS seven and CentOS eight only currently. Um, there's all on a, a very different paradigm. We have the Kubernetes operator, and yes, this is a this is an operator that like a management container that installs and manages and supervises the, the containers that actually run pulp, which is basically we consider those containers that run pulp part of it. Um, in the past, we had a insta demo script, which is like a quick way of installing pulp via a single script and even uninstalling it, but we retired that. Uh, for people that want a easy to use experience like that, we instead have the single container, which can just run on top of Docker or, or Podman. And that includes all the, all the services, like even, you know, in all the services in one container. So, to summarize the installer uh, user experience talk I gave yesterday, we went through the installer's quick start guide, and I, you know, I expressed that I had usability concerns for uh, any sort of small scale sites, like particularly when there's one single pulp server. I just want to set something up quickly without planning a big infrastructure, and or and also for anybody who's just not an expert with Ansible. The hard parts of this quick start guide are writing your variables um, as well as running the installer when an error occurs. And it's on it's just unclear uh, to many users that you know how to interpret the errors that the installer produces and the fact that it's safe to modify your variables and rerun the installer, like you don't have to blow away your entire virtual machine or whatever you're installing it on when there's an error. You just you just rerun it, it's gonna be identical, it's gonna Pick up where it's left off, or where it got the error. I mean, they'll rerun the prior steps, but they'll say I did nothing, so you can, can safely rerun it. And well, I could go over all the potential installer improvements, but I'll I'll let people talk first, and then see if any of them match their needs, or if we have other improvements to add to this slide as people talk. So.
you have any users here that want to talk about their experiences with using these inst uh, installers? Florian, did you? Yes, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, now you're so nice and responsible people. I don't want to be mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Uh, this now, is... <laughs> I'm, now I'm talking from from my perspective. I was kind of looking at it and uh, thinking, do I, do I use it? Does it help me, or um, how how is it like? And um, I'll just find my notes. Yes, I found out um, the the Ansible um, variables. They um, hide me. Uh, they hide away the variables in Pulp itself. So if, if I follow along through the instructions, um, I see this more as an orchestration and not as an installation, mm -hmm. because afterwards um, it uh, it is it is like. like can you hear me? Or? Yes, I can hear you. I'm just trying to. I'm taking notes and I'm trying to. Uh, I'm I'm trying to understand. Thinking to myself about what you're saying. Mike, Mike, would you, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Would you mind Stop. muting your your? Did we lose him? Oh no, there's somebody went away. Mike, would you mind because yeah, exactly. Just keep muted. Thank you. You know, I'm I'm. Setting up a virtual machine, I'm following the instructions, and then I see, oh, now I cannot read um, where is the the config file of of pulp and where are the config values of the plugins. They are now hidden behind um, the uh, behind the Ansible variables. Um, that's for me more a problem because perhaps later I'd like to use Ansible myself. Now I cannot write my own integration and look up where the config is. I have to understand the whole of the um, Ansible installer universe. Um, I tried to do a word count um, on the um, pulp installer and excluding uh, the git directories, word count is uh, over 45,000 uh, words. So wow. because <laughs> it, it's concerned with examples and the operator perhaps and anything, so it's difficult for me to um, grasp all of it. I don't need all of it. and what I'm ending up with is it's not Debian any, anymore. It's now an uh, orchestration thing that is there. I cannot rely on uh, restarting the service. Um, finding out the version that is installed requires me to run the whole playbook because it is not um, the state of the operating system. But after the playbook, I can see the number of um, plugins with all their versions. So should it fail then? It's not considered um, a failure of the installer itself. So mm -hmm. then I see, okay, okay, this is now something different. Pulp as a whole has not, is, is not, um, has not a version. It's now, it's not um, one software package. It's a distribution of software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is no, and if I consider something in an installer, um, I would look at the pulp project as a whole. Would say it's a, mm, distributed in the kind of they are multiple repositories. It would need um, an agreed version, if it's only to list what plugins are now tested with what version of pulp core. It would need some mm -hmm. level of um, distribution-wide agreement on default values, which are those that are needed to get it run. And um, those um, configuration values um, that are needed for um, supported integrations, Reddit, Postgres, and not much else. Mm -hmm. So that's the different difference for a user one, when something in an installer is, can I yum install or upgit install that? And if not, what do I take responsibility for when I do install it? So the question for me is, like, would I allow someone to uh, push something to um, pulp from a Jenkins file? I was like, hell no. <laughs> it would, um, my um, pipeline, my de development pipeline could come to a halt 
because someone wants to verify the version of pipe that is running, runs the playbook, and it perhaps updates a plugin because I didn't set version variables. And now there's a new version and it's different. The next um, environment, project environment, I don't know if I get a repeatable uh, installation. So this, this is uh, not something that could be handled by how do we make it friendly and do we um, set up a wrapper around um, Ansible itself. That's, that's not the point. And I don't care if it's um, uh, a container, it's fine for me. But then in a container, um, I wouldn't find the binaries um, that uh, constitute um, pulp. And also, um, not it's it's not that the uh, Django migrations are checked into the file system of the container. No, no, it's uh, there is the uh, installer. It's not a uh, pulp all-in-one container. It's the installer container. After the install starts, everything what constitutes uh, pulp is done afterwards. So I guess that's what's happening to a lot of people. They try um, docker run pulp slash pulp, and it doesn't even fail because um, the um, pulp installer deems it best to restart pulp until Redis and Postgres are up. So it's in a endlessly repeating loop. So that's what, what if the installer target system is uh, Docker, the people who Docker run pulp pulp, and they see it's, it's repeating. Uh, in the console, you could you could see, ah, it says that some mandatory variables are not set. But as an uh, installer per se, I guess for Docker, it should run on its default values. That's, I've posted something where I tried to write it down. Um, don't know if it's totally confusing or um, if I'm telling you things you know but have decisions against it or if it helps. That's okay. Then that's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I Warren, want can, I, can I try to tell back what I've heard? I just want to make sure that I'm understanding it. And I very much appreciate the perspective. Um, it, so, what I think I heard was that. Um, one of the core problems is that Pulp is a distribution of multiple softwares. And at least one issue with that is that it's, it's pretty murky and unclear which versions of which you'll be receiving at any given time. Is that close to or far away from one of, one of, your, um, one of the issues that you've, you're pointing out? I don't necessarily think it's a problem, but it's a problem for um, a project that is called Pulp Installer. Right. I don't see it that it installs Pulp. I see it that it orchest orchest orchestrates my system into a Pulp system. So I got yeah. the... Uh, I, have, I have in this pipeline, what is in my project, a pipeline, uh, a pipeline step, publish... Uh, build artifact is not a step, but it's a whole project dependency. I'm responsible to see what version is there. And I repeat this every time I set up a pipeline that has this step. I cannot start, this happens before I start to work out the um, pub workflows I need. It's already a mystery box because there is no um, and it's called installer. If it was um, installing something, I'd know it has some kind of properties. Yeah, I see I what you mean. I think. Thank you. I think to clarify one thing, um, the design of the installer, even with the three point sixteen uh, big changes we made to the to how it installs versions, is like if you rerun the installer against this a machine where it's already installed. And you don't specify like upgrade true, or you don't bump the version strings. It will not upgrade anything. It will not upgrade pop core or the plugins, including updates. But if you do, uh, but if you set up, if you rerun the installer against machine A, and then you 
if you run install against machine A, and then a month later you run install against machine B, it will install different versions of popcorn and the plugins. That's correct? Yes, and um, and that's and that's okay. Um, the, the thing is, because you invite lots of users, um, try and install it, and they um, oftentimes come back. Somehow it doesn't install because that's not what uh, a user would expect. User would expect I have an operating system. The operating system, if it's not Windows, um, provides the installer. You write an installer package. And yeah, it obeys the software obeys to the typical rules. Uh, you know, if I check the the version this way with a uh, playbook, it restarts um, Redis and uh, Postgres. Yeah. So if I have because you use the Galen guy rules to um, install Postgres, I'm right. We use the Galen guy role. Yes. Yeah. So if I um, in my Debian system already installed Postgres. Probably the port will be um, already in use, or if I do yeah, agree. the other w w uh, way around, or if this is before before I touched it, it restarts uh, services that is not according to operating system policy. So I know I've got lots of responsibility before I even start to use it. Yeah, um, Florian, uh, I really appreciate this feedback, and I just want to make sure that's yeah. stated. Um, yeah, I agree totally. I want to make sure that clear. Yeah, definitely. So, um, uh, hugely appreciate it. So, um, what I think I'm hearing, and if I keep telling it back, it's just because I want to make like make sure that I'm hearing it right. So, what I think I'm hearing here is makes sense to me. What I think I'm hearing is, hey, normal Linux sysadmins have all of this typical expectations like package managers and using, you know, whatever the system, um, the init um, uh, manager is to restart those processes. And, you know, part of the problem with the installer um, is that it doesn't follow those conventions. It, it uh, does a whole bunch of other things, kind of like what you're talking about. Like it installs Postgres not using the, the DNF or apt packages it installs it with another method and so this is kind of like incompatible with the typical linux sysadmins and and if i've got that right i pretty much agree with you um because and we you know as a project the pulp project always works you know always has a huge uphill battle in that sense because the expectations of a large number of system administrators across many distributions is huge um, and well in place. And, you know, here we come with like this whole other different set. So is that more or less what you're, what you're saying? Well, I wouldn't expect you to support all and everything, but for example, if you have, um, uh, a, a Docker image that is just pulp, but with, um, the, um, Django migrations, um, put down into the Docker image. So, you know, probably if I have to use it, the Docker style, um, I would need um, a, a Postgres image and the Redis image, and then I need to do some uh, config in my um, Docker Compose file. And I can see, okay, this is Docker standard. But now if yeah. I try to use it this Docker standard way, I don't even find, probably even don't find the binaries because there's the installer, but there's not part. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I want to clarify one thing. Uh, because, uh, as Brian Tegui misinterpreted what Florian said earlier, the when the installer installs uh, Postgres from apt or from DNF, although we may use a separate repository, the, the surprise, it sounds like Florian's surprise is that the installer touches the dependencies of Postgres and Redis at all. The fact that we install our desired version of Postgres and that might conflict with the installed version of Postgres in the system already. The fact that we, even if it's a desired version is already installed, we not only configure Postgres and Redis, but we restart them. Um, normally when you install an RPM package, like if I just install like the RPM package for like 
a, what's a big service that would normally have an RPM package and would do a bunch of stuff in the triplets? Like, I mean, say you... The kernel. Say, yeah. Say, I'm thinking, say there's a LAMP application. You wouldn't assume that it start, restarts MySQL. Uh, the LAMP application, which is a bunch of uh, PHP scripts, the RPM scriptlets, when you're just running install, would not restart Postgres, you know? It wouldn't, so, or MySQL. So that, I agree with you. It is more orchestration than installer. And I might have, that ties into uh, my suggestions. Um, and I do want to, I would, you know, I, like I said, I really value, appreciate you opening up about all these problems. And I do want to clear, make sure I understand some things correctly. Uh, you said that before I started providing, discussing possible solutions, you said that the, uh, the, the variables are hidden away in the installer. You mean like, say you want to set the number of pulp workers to a value, like, you know, for worker processes and that's specified in the installer and you specify in the installer variables, but if it's on disk, it will, and you modify it on disk later, it gets blown away. Is that what you're saying? It blows away if you yeah, run the kind installer? Of, kind of. If, if I find the uh, pulp main config file and change something, it's not like you do um, line and file. Yeah. But it gets regenerated like uh, the old SUSE days, just mm. one. <laughs> yeah. Let me restart your X server for you. <laughs> oh, right. I remember using OpenSUSE or SUSE back in like the early 2000s. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's been on my mind. That's been a, a, a user, uh, you know, an issue that I wouldn't want to address for a long time is how to make it so we merge use settings with what settings users already have on the installed system. For whenever people rerun the installer, whether it's verification or upgrades. So, yeah, I'm making note of that right now. Grant, you had something to say to you. So, but I'm hearing, and I, I think uh, this goes to the, the discussion that's actually happening in chat as well. We've done, we've lived in an environment and done a lot of work where pulp is essentially running as, you know, the machine it's on is an appliance. It's running pulp. And we've set an environment up where the user's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let pulp do its thing and get it up and running. And that's really what we've been focused on. But what this has really brought to the front of my head is, yeah, great. But there's an awful lot of where, we, where we'd like to be is have this be used in existing environments like Florian is talking about. I already have a, a big chunk of iron out there. It's already got Postgres. Res, Redis is already working on it. I just want to install an app called pulp on this system and i've got to get my head around uh you know it, it, it's it's kind of a, an orthogonal way of thinking about how to install this thing how to install the because it is pulp has a lot of moving pieces if you start with nothing if you've got nothing on your system pulp installs a lot of things for you to get it all up and running but in a non-greenfield situation like florian's talking about a lot of those pieces are already there how do we fit in like any other app that would be put on one of those and i just realized i'll 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 plus one what everybody has said this has been really useful to get this point of view because my head hasn't been turned that way and now i'm like oh my god there's a whole section of the computing realm that i have missed completely um walking the line between between i just want to do dnf install pulp and then pulp dash dash start on my existing system. And someone is like, well, I did that, but it started complaining because it couldn't find Postgres, or I did that and it couldn't find Redis or, or something. How, making it easy for the neophyte user is um, is the, the, the challenge that I hear from this. Is Both of those need to be possible. Both of those are very valuable use cases. And I, anyway, have been focused on one um, and need to focus on another. I'm kind of babbling here, but this, the, I think Tanya hit it, an installer and an orchestrator. Those are two different use cases. I think, I think Florian said that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, yes, but no problem. And I don't need necessarily to have this kind of integration integrated into a distribution. Um, I only mean um, 
something uh, contained that I can um, understand as uh, as its own piece. Like if, if for example, if all the, the pulp stuff were in one image and I knew I have to orchestrate it with uh, two other image b images because those are the services and we are in the Docker world, that's fine for me too. But um, hiding this away and having um, their cycle, this um, loudly screams at me, you have to be somewhat of your own developer. And it's not that some installation is broken and Docker image is broken. It's tweak it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I say, oh, that's kind of intimidating because once I have um, software with, with uh, their um, kind of interfaces to the other service world, um, then I know where to start from so that I know either I'm misconfiguring it um, or I get my workflows wrong, but as the software itself, it's now installed correctly. This is something I don't, I also see you pro pro prolific users. Um, if it was uh, Kong or the, the guy from uh, Monday, he also was, was there um, last year. Douglas. Um, yes, Douglas. Um, they package it themselves. They, um, yeah, they, they are all in. <laughs> They, yeah, and I and I I want to make this distinction when I'm ready to patch something, when I want to have a custom solution, um, or when I'm just using, just using right. and trying to if I can handle it. Yeah, I think so. If I understand this correctly, I want to make sure I understand uh, one of one of your pain points is that you'd like the installer to install pulp and then connect a database, and then after connecting to the database. Then you uh, uh, you do the initialization like stuff like we'll do stuff like collect static that requires the database. Is that correct? Would be one solution. The thing I care about is I want to be able to see uh, pulp as its own kind of distribution with clear handover points where um, the user world is and where where the development world is. This is something right. I cannot see. I was pressuring the Pulp CLI guys for um, uh, integration tests and for their supported workflows thingies because I was trying to find out now if I'm going on this road for the first time, what versions of of Pulp Core main plugins and CLI plugins would I install so that I don't so I get the easiest entry point. Where's the front right. for me? <laughs> yes, I know. So I think I have a really good solution to your distribution problem. Uh, but I do want to address the whole uh, pulp versus services versus dependency services first. I think we have a good example of how to use the installer in this way. Um, uh, I have up on my I'm presenting a section of our docs. This is formally on the website and the blog. But we updated the blog for the current settings. and and we put it moved this this documentation to the inst uh, installer. It's under it's under customized deployment and then deployment scenarios. And one of those scenarios is pulp server with existing infrastructure. Now, here we, I use like example web server, but example web server could be localhost. And here I use existing uh, Postgres server, but existing Postgres server could be a uh, uh, localhost. Have you? And we notice that we use, when we specify the roles, instead of saying pulp all services, we just say pulp services and then pulp web server. So with this case, it assumes that Postgres is already installed and accessible. It assumes that Redis is installed and accessible. Would that be an improvement for your use case, even if, it, even if you want to install and then connect later? Uh, somehow paired with. Um a suggestion I heard from Grant already, if there was um, a client-side config test where, where I could see, um, first I do this, and then I to, to check it off, I do some test to see um, up running, I'm feeling fine, says Pulp. Uh, if right. I had that, then OK, then it would be more like that. Uh, yeah, but that then it should, but then it should report. Ah, this refers to Pulpcore version plugin one. This working version uh, two plugin uh, 
Um, that and then I have to note it down and say, okay, my repeatable installation is this instruction with those versions. Not a single version, not that I could see it. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. The whole and I could see the responsibilities. Oh, yes. I mean, so yeah, in my head, I have, and in my notes, I have like five different uh, fundamental issues of, or fundamental pain points we identified. I'm trying to address each of them one by one. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so moving on to the distribution aspect. And yeah, so, and it's, that's, that's really good for me to know that you actually like rerun the installer. I installed it successfully with these two plugins. Now I'm going to rerun it with a third and see what happens. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying one second. Is that what your workflow is like? No, I'm I'm saying for me, um, this is what I think um, is installed software. I, I know uh, some things after I have my instructions over. I know some things are now um, valid. Yeah. I see what you mean. Um, it's it's of course it's similar to what the the um, Linux distribution installers do, but it has some some level of um, consistencies that are now guaranteed for me. I know from the operation side, I know what upgrading and what uh, config changing and what uh, reloading is, and I can say I have a problem. If I could say I have a problem with the pulp distribution uh, version 4.1, um, I'm just installing, I'm just trying my little workflow here, three lines, and it could be communicated that way. Yeah. Yeah, that would be fine. That's something I don't know. When I report, when I try to report something, there would be lots of questions. What have you running? What is your setup? Those questions you ask your prol prolific users. Um, yeah. Could an installer answer that? Because some things are set and agreed on. Right. Yeah, I you see, see what you mean. Setting, setting local host in your example with the with the VARs. And yeah. The installer wouldn't wouldn't need to have me set the um, local host because it could be um, a default value. Right. Yeah. I see what you mean. It's. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of all the possible ways I could re-engineer the installer or move, move into separate projects. But um, I do, uh, it seems like people are raising hands. Do they want to add this conversation? Because I was going to move into, I was going to move into in, uh, dis, uh, distribution, uh, ways of making it like a, uh, a distribution, ways of practical solutions to make it like a distribution with predefined versions. I think. Um, Douglas has had something yeah, to add I'll let, to an yes, earlier I'll, I'll point. Let Douglas go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Douglas. Unfortunately, I've just come off another meeting, so I've come to this a little bit late. So I may be missing some context. So I just want to apologize around that at first. Um, but certainly from my personal experience, um, The, is, the, is the installer intended to manage ongoing configuration, not just install time configuration? And it is, and I'm unhappy with the fact that we can't merge the ongoing configuration. OK. Uh, I wish we would merge it rather than blow it away. Yeah. Um, so. From, I'm very late to the game when it comes to cloud infrastructure. So everything that I'm going to say is from the Neolithic period of IT. So apologies. Um, but I have a very, certainly in the enterprise that I work in, um, we have a very strong requirement to understand what's being laid down, how it's being laid down, and control it. We have our own configuration management that we need to integrate with. Um, we don't want to bifurcate on that at all, if at all avoidable. Um, and one of the things that I found, it was very difficult 
following what was available online um, in the documentation to work out what is a pulp installation. Um, and I, I appreciate that the installer is there and I went through that to try and figure out what I should be doing, where certain configurations should be. Um, but I would certainly say that, and this is not intended as any insult towards this, but for my use case, it wasn't helpful um, or as helpful as I found previous, say the, the Pulp 2 documentation. Um, it, it felt as though it seemed to be missing an right. architectural overview to, you know, sometimes pretty pictures just help. Um, and it was difficult for me, even coming from Pulp 2, to work out how does, how is this all expected to fit together? Um, where are the configuration files? What are the different settings? Um, I wasn't quite as caught up with the, the versioning and the plugin versioning, largely because I just went with the newest. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I would have liked to see more traditional documentation a, as an enterprise user. Um, I yeah, I, I I it would I would be I don't think I could run the installer um, ever outside of a POC. And I think, I think for me, there's multiple use scenarios. One was the POC, and I think you guys have multiple solutions for that. You've got the single pulp in a container instance. You've got this installer, which I think would probably be perfect as a POC solution, but then transitioning out of the POC into a fully fledged enterprise deployment, it feels as though there's a bit of a gap. Um, the installer holds your hand all the way through it and maybe too much so that you don't actually know what's being deployed. I'm sorry if this wasn't relevant. Hopefully someone would have stopped me if it wasn't. Cheers, Douglas. No, this is perfect. No, and this relevant. is perfect. Yeah, I mean, I do want to say that, like, you know, I, I used to be a sysadmin myself. I was a sysadmin for like full-time for several years, intern part-time for years before that. And I even researched the architecture of Foreman and Catello and knew all the punk components like pulp and candle pin before I started using it. So I, and I've often had requirements like, can we use our existing uh, MySQL cluster? Oh, why not? Oh, does it really need Postgres? So. I understand this, and I should have, you know, I, the installer has always, ever since I started, has always had what I thought were documentation gaps, and I, I agree with you that as a valuable scenario, and I do think that the installer's docs or the usage or the code should be more oriented around these components, like the, the, the other services on the same system of Postgres and Redis. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking of ways to try to make this clearer or to change it right now. But yeah, that's, that is significant. I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Brizio, have you anything to, to add? So yeah, I, I just want to share that Florian, it was kind of mind blowing experience to me. Uh, I, I've been feeling like something like it's not okay with the installer but I, I never could put it in words and when you mentioned this orchestration versus installation thing yeah it, it like it clicked something on me i i still don't know like the, the right path or the best solution but but yeah i i don't know what to say but yeah something changed and i will be learning more about it and i'm curious how can i reach you to keep talking and proposing ideas and see if we are going to the right direction. Yeah, and I want to ask one more question before this ends uh, about a potential solution. Um, just one second, Mike. Um, and if, if Florian, I have your contact details. Um, would you be OK if I share them with uh, Fabrizio so he can get some feedback from you 
out after this session. Would that be okay? Yes, of course, that's okay. Um, also, I'll be in the, in the um, Pulp or Pulp Dev channel, whatever you choose. Um, so. Great, we hang out there all the time. Brian, have you have you something else um, you want to add? Um, yes, uh, I was just thinking back um, to this post, which we came up with a long time ago, and it kind of um, talks a little bit about kind of why we ended up going this direction, which doesn't really, you know, defend or justify it at all. Um, but it's interesting if you consider the installer in the context of the project's history. With Pulp 2, we had RPMs, we were an RPM only based install. And so we really wanted something like cross distro. Um, but one of the other main things was we, our users kind of just wanted something that was like a single button you can push and um, keeping it easy, you know, and that's kind of why we end up dealing with, um, you know, dealing with the database and dealing with Redis, et cetera, and doing all those things and the web server installations and the configuration of all those services and all these things. And I, I think maybe one thing that we've lost along the way is the ability to, I mean, I think that this is what I'm taking away from what I'm hearing, the ability to simply and concisely understand um, everything that's not the immediate pulp application and um, being able to go and configure those as you need, um, which was kind of the, uh, anyways, it's, it's almost like a full circle that we've come now. <laughs> um, we've made a really great button and, um, but people are not able to use it in a lot of ways for all the reasons. Um, and, and I think that also like talk about use case mismatches, we, you know, uh, like, um, Douglas, I don't know what you use at your shop. I think maybe it's salt. I don't know, but you mentioned, regardless, you mentioned you want your own configuration management system. Well, you know, we don't want users to have to learn a configuration management system. So we have decided for them that they should use Ansible. And if you want to use the installer, then you pretty much are going to use that. Oh, wait, now we have a mismatch. And so making it not decomposable, I feel like has been one of the challenges. And um, I think, I think it's great for POC. I, I really do. From a from my perspective, it's perfect for a POC, and it's great to prove out what does it mean to scale horizontally. I, I've not even got my head around that, but using the the installer, I believe, would allow you visibility of scaling horizontally. The only problem is you've got to work backwards from what the installer's done. To, to see what that would look like if you were to re-implement it in a in a enterprise solution, um, and not depending on the installer for that would be handy. Yeah, I agree completely. And if you yeah. look at the at the bullet points on that blog post that I linked to, one of the main things is clustered installations, um, and I think perhaps our tool or this tool has really focused on that as like a primary concern and perhaps at the expense of single installations. Yeah, and I do want to point out one thing. The irony here is that the way the ans the roles are st structured, we have separate roles for each of these services. Like pulp database is one role, pulp Redis is another role, pulp web server is, another, is a third role, and then we have one role for each of the pulp services, like one role for API, one role for content, one role for uh, for a uh, worker, no more resource manager now. So that's the irony is that we have internally, we track the services, but users aren't aware of, of that or, or how an installer isn't oriented around this and, you know, uh, from a user perspective. So I'm like, I'm glad you, I'm kind of glad you said this because it's, it's a big problem. It's an important problem I can solve, but I can solve it with, without rewriting or throwing away the entire thing, you know? Go ahead, go ahead, Florian. Yes, it's also what I was kind of thinking when I was um, uh, browsing. Um, I was I was aware of this change, uh, RPM um, versus um, PIP. And then I was going installation PIP and was thinking now perhaps I can see um, this, um, system the service files to see what is actually started 
And then it only says, now use the installer. And I said, ah, then I'm back at the installer and trying to extract it from Ansible. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. There's no example service file on this. So I actually want to do this. I want to make this the service files like relatively static and then override the variables with the systemd overrides. That's been on my to-do list for a while. No, I was just thinking um, as a method of standard method of distribution, um, I, I recognize part 3 has changed from RPM to PIP, distributed the Python way. And now when we are talking about the installer, we're somewhere on the main page, relatively central. And now we are talking in the installer, then it comes back, yeah, not RPM, but perhaps source of the individual plugins. It's um, it's a moving target in yeah. how it's received inside the project. Yeah. That, that was in this little um, uh, project I have just uh, written some text. What um, was uh, I, I was considering? Yes, for a project that consists of multiple source code repositories, there needs to be some kind of um, distribution-wide conventions, like minimum variables that we need to start this up. Right. Yeah, I have a moderately good sense of what you mean by distribution-wide uh, conventions, and I'm going to read more of, of, your, of the URL you shared. But I do agree that it's like you would normally not expect installer to do certain things, and you expect to do other things only. So, do we? Uh, I think everybody who raised their hand got to talk, and I think do we have more time, or? Uh, I think that we have a little bit more time. Has yeah. anybody else anything to to add? I would just like to point out one possible solution for the uh, the distribution problem. So when you install from RPM, that's the case. Like the RPM repository is the distribution. But installing from PIP, I've, I've, I've been mulling for a while now, is uh, I've been considering, is just having an optional mode for the installer where PIP mode is installing from like a, a, a frozen PIP, a frozen PIP list of packages with all their exact versions. and we would bump the versions of plugins and and up dependencies and stuff according to CI. And this would, you know, this would be held back. Like we would say, we can't do a pip freeze for 3.15 until this plugin's available. We might just have separate streams. Like here's a 3.15 stream, here's a 3.16 stream, and as new plugins become available for 3.16, we they get added to the list of plugins to be installed. This is one possible solution. I, uh, I, I wonder if you guys think of that. As long as the installer is able to give it a name and one can look up, um, if I tell the installer this, all-inclusive version type is something that was minimally tested and something that can be referred to, then it can be as easy as a list in the installer. Yep, minimally tested at least, yes. Great. I'm glad you. I think that's that's valuable feedback. Yes. yes. I mean, uh, on a personal note, there's a lot of there's a lot of. You know, I'd like to spend a lot more time on the usability of the installer, and uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to accommodate new features and pulp, new in pulp and new features and plugins and plugin. These teams needs this. This team needs that. Over the last year and a half, but you know that you know here is also you know. So I really do hope to work on these improvements that you users need. I hope to, and now I have a better understanding of what improvements you users do actually need. Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, you very much for your time, Florin. Really appreciate it. Um, I think that um, there have been many people that haven't perhaps been able to articulate some of the frustrations as well so it's very rare that we have somebody that comes along and spends time and tells us exactly what they are experiencing so that is that has been really great is there anything else um florian is there anything else that you want to add before we finish today 
Now I think the rest I have some some people that were asking how we coordinate a little further than we can do in um, the in the chat. So because then there are individual questions. Okay, doc. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Florian. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. I'm gonna stop the recording. And then